Hey everyone, my name is Andrew DeCessrody. I'm an MSW, which means I have a master's in social work. Um, and I'm currently a graduate student in the sociology department at the University of Alberta. My research there is focused on parenting, specifically how patriarchal motherhood impacts the lives of women. Um, my thesis specifically looks at the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on graduate students who mother. Um, so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna take a closer look at the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on mothers in academia, and hopefully that will lead us to a better understanding of mothering as a whole today. So I think in order to truly understand how the pandemic impacted mothers in academia, we need to first take a step back and look at a number of different aspects of mothers' lives. So to do this, what I've done is I've broken up this presentation into four main parts. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at all of these pieces individually, and then we're gonna put them all together like a puzzle in order to get a true full understanding of what academic mothers' lives were like during the pandemic. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how mothering impacts women's employment as a whole. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to specifically examine the lives of women in academia before the pandemic. Then what we're going to do is we're going to look at how the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus upended the lives of mothers, specifically mothers in academia. And then finally, what we're going to do is we're going to take some time to look at some potential negative long-term impacts of the pandemic, as well as some potential mitigation factors um, that have been put forward by a few scholars in order to mitigate the damage from the pandemic. So the first thing that I want to do today is I want to talk briefly about my own positionality as a researcher on the subject, as I'm very close to my research. Um, during my time completing my first graduate degree, I actually unexpectedly found out that I was pregnant. Um, I knew immediately that this was going to be difficult because I was completing a social work degree. And what comes with a social work degree is a large amount of time in the field. There's not a lot of options to work from home and there are not a lot of options to complete that online. So when I found out I was pregnant, I actually told my department before I had even told my in-laws. Um, and I went to them with a really detailed plan that would have allowed me to take time off after having the baby and still graduate on time. Their response to me was that this would not be fair to my placement agency to start a placement and then stop. And they also said that me taking time off would inhibit my ability to reach the practice level required for my degree. So the night that I gave birth, I actually sat in seminar class for three hours in active labor, as I genuinely believed that trying to find a way to make up for missing that class would have been more painful for me than the contractions I was experiencing sitting in that lecture. Um, afterwards, I left class and I drove to the hospital and I gave birth. Um, and during this time, I took matters into my own hands and due to a prior connection that I had by chance from my time working in the field of sexual assault, I found a supervisor who was willing to let me take time off after giving birth to recover and come back to my placement and finish my degree. He is the only reason that I graduated. Afterwards, I took time off from my own goals uh, so my husband could focus on his career. And it would not be until my son turned three that we could finally afford childcare and that I could go back to school. I still actually keep those emails from my old department that discourage me from taking time off in my inbox. Um, I cannot bring myself to delete them. They still really sit with me. Um, and they really serve as a reminder to me of what I came back to academia to do, which is create an environment in which women and mothers have equal access to higher education. And that's a big part of why I'm talking to you today is I return to academia and all of these structural barriers for mothers were still there, 
But now we also had a pandemic that we had to deal with. So I think the first step in really understanding how the pandemic infiltrated the lives of mothers is to look at the motherhood penalty. So the motherhood penalty is the circumstances in which women who have kids experience lower pay, discrimination, and a lack of seniority in management positions within their field. So when we pull this apart, it's a little bit easier to begin understanding the motherhood penalty through looking specifically at pay discrimination. So I'm sure that a lot of you have heard of the wage gap. Interestingly, women without kids have actually been quite adept in closing this wage gap. Uh, and this is especially true of white women. Um, so what we need to do actually is start shifting the idea of the wage gap from an understanding of the inequality between women and men to more of an inequality of mothers and men. Um, fathers are not impacted in the same ways by parenthood, um, and some research has even shown that they experience what is known as a fatherhood bonus, where they get paid more after having children. So on the slides here um, are some charts that Vox put together that showcase the results of a really interesting study in Denmark that helps us really visualize this. Um, and this data is similar to what we have in North America in that women and men, the wage gap is closing, um, but women are, with children are hit really hard after the birth of their first child. Um, it is estimated that women lose about 7% of their total income per child. Um, of course, this gap is larger for women of color. So now, based on that data, we've established that the motherhood penalty does exist. And women do indeed, women who are mothers, get paid less than men. Um, so now the question is why? Why is that? Um, and we can start to apply a theoretical framework to this problem to try and figure out the reason. Um, interestingly, there's no singular reason that this occurs, and researchers have actually struggled to come to a definitive conclusion as to why mothers are paid so much less. Um, so one hypothesis is, you know, firstly, there's just the matter of simple discrimination. And there's research that backs this up in, in that, you know, if you give a group of random people some resumes or if you give um, a group of employers some resumes and, and you give them a stack of women with kids and a stack of women without kids, um, they really prefer to hire the women that don't have kids. Um, mothers appear to be less competent to employers and less dedicated to their work. Um, a second aspect of why mothers may be paid less is that women have to take time off from their work when they give birth. Um, women are far more likely to take maternity leave than men are paternity leave. Um, and because they're the ones that carry the child and give birth, as well as cultural influences in terms of maternity leave, they have gaps in their employment due to having a child. Um, and this influences things like promotions and, and seniority and, and management positions, right? Um, and then there's a third reason for the motherhood penalty, which um, really resonates with me and I find really interesting. Um, and that's just exhaustion. Mothers are exhausted. Um, they're exhausted at work and their minds are on other things. Um, we have to be careful with this one because it's a really controversial theory uh, because I'm sure, as you can imagine, interpreted without context, it makes it sound like women are paid less because they're lazy, right? Oh, well, mothers are just paid less because they're lazy and they're distracted and, and they want to be at home with their kids. Um, but it's important to know that a lot of mothers are actually working the equivalent of two full-time jobs. So this accumulation of two full-time jobs is called the second shift. Um, I think it's gaining more popularity um, in terms of mainstream conversations. So you may have heard of it before this presentation. Um, it's also referred to sometimes as the balancing act. And this is when after completing their full-time professional roles, 
women come home and they have to complete a whole second shift of domestic and emotional labor. So what this looks like is all of the cooking, all of the meal prepping, all of the cleaning, all of the appointment planning, so doctor's appointments, play dates. Um, women are doing far more of these tasks than men. Um, and I do think a really interesting aspect of this that we don't talk enough about is holidays, specifically Christmas. Um, labor around holidays primarily falls to women. Um, and so of course they're exhausted. And of course their work may be different than the men they're working with that do not have to complete a second shift once they get home from their jobs. So women in academia experience all of the things we've already talked about, um, but what's unique to academia is this extreme neoliberal environment. So neoliberalism is an ideology that values individualism, competition, and productivity. It's capitalism in its purest form. It is survival of the fittest. Um, and it's something our government is certainly a fan of. And when our government values this ideology, it shapes the decisions of the university. So a prime example of this is actually the cuts in higher education in Alberta um, that we've been victim to at the hands of Jason Kenney and the UCP. There are simply less access to resources and funding within the academy. Um, and up on screen actually is a picture I took from the University of Alberta Student Union protest against the UCP cuts to education. The students are feeling this so hard, especially the grad students, that they organized a protest at the legislature. Um, so what neoliberalism looks like within the academy is it translates to assigning a value to each portion of your academic work. So the things that are valued highly are publishing, completing your degree quickly, completing your research quickly, writing books, and winning grants. Um, and because of this neoliberal environment within the university, as well as larger budget cuts as a whole, there are just less jobs in academia. So what this does is it creates a powder keg of an environment in which everyone is competing against each other for what little funding and faculty positions are left. And I'm sure you can imagine, based on what we've already discussed, who may have a disadvantage within this environment. So when we look at just the hard data of representation in academia, we can see that women as a whole are underrepresented in more senior positions in academia. So that means that full-time faculty members are less likely to be women, non-tenure track positions are more likely to be women. And on average, in all forms of employment at the university, faculty members who are women earn less than men. So what I have here is actually a graph from the American Association of University Professors that lets us visualize this wage gap in academia. Um, so what you can see is throughout all positions, full-time, tenure, non-tenure, women earn less than men on average. So even within um, an institution that is deemed progressive, women are still experiencing that wage gap. So the daily lives and the individual experiences of women in academia are just really stressful. Um, academia requires continuous work. It is something that is all consuming. Um, it is something that you cannot separate from your home, right? Um, and when you're at home and you're not doing your work and you're spending time with your kids, you feel guilty. And when you're at home and you're doing your work and you're not spending time with your kids, you also feel guilty. Um, research has shown that mothers feel a huge time crunch between childcare and research pressures. Um, there's definitely a blurring of boundaries between home life and academic life. Um, women in academia are greatly concerned about the impact that having children will have on their careers. They're acutely aware of the negative impact, right? Um, a lot of times women will put off having children until after they've achieved tenure, right? Because they don't want it to impact their chances um, of not getting tenure. 
Um, a lot of women who become pregnant in academia feel like they have to hide their pregnancy. They're scared that it will be seen unfavorably by their colleagues. Um, they feel really guilty and they feel really stressed. And in many cases, they feel like they can't compete with men because men just have more time to dedicate to their research. Um, and unfortunately, you know what? A lot just leave. Um, and this is known as the leaky pipeline. Um, and this is where what you see happen is the higher you go up in academics, the higher the attrition rate. So the more intense, the more competitive, the more demanding it gets, a lot of women just leave. Um, it's just too difficult. So I have a really special interest in graduate student mothers, um, just based on my own experiences and where my thesis research is going. And graduate student mothers are in, e are in an even more precarious position than faculty members, right? They have less security um, and they are not paid as much. And this neoliberal ideology uh, has certainly trickled down and now is extended to graduate students. And we're now expected to engage in higher productivity and publishing, right? Uh, this is called the professionalization of grad school. And, you know, it's really difficult because we're going through all of this and we are not getting paid salary to do it. Uh, research shows that graduate students face high rates of depression and anxiety at baseline. And graduate student mothers really struggle with the stress of not being able to afford childcare. And they also have less access to departmental support. Um, much like faculty mothers, they will also downplay their maternity. They really like to compartmentalize their identities. They don't like to bring um, the fact that they're a mother into the field with them. Uh, so what I like to do when I think of graduate student mothers is I just like to think of them as a more exacerbated form of everything academic mothers struggle with. There's just far less research dedicated to their experiences, which is certainly something that I'm trying to change. So I think based on what we've talked about throughout this lecture, um, you know, the motherhood penalty mixed with this severe neoliberal academic environment, you can see how adding COVID-19 to the mix took all of these existing problems and just made them 10 times worse. Uh, so really interestingly, prior to COVID-19, there's research that established that when a child wakes up sick and cannot go to school, it is predominantly the mother who stays home with the child. Uh, and this certainly extended into the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so when we look at data, at both American and Canadian data, we can see that it was predominantly women who left the workforce during the pandemic. So a lot of this was because someone needed to provide childcare during the closures. Um, really interestingly too, is there's some initial studies out there that have shown that couples made this decision based on two things. So one was practicality. So the person who made less money was the person who was going to stay home with the kids. Uh, but another factor that came into these decisions was really a cultural one, right? Um, so traditionally it was the woman who stayed home and looked after the kids and that really infiltrated decision-making uh, in heterosexual couples in terms of who's gonna stay home and watch the kids during the school closures. Um, another really interesting thing that happened throughout the pandemic is women's jobs, um, they're just more likely to be able to complete them from home. So, you know, because they were able to stay home and do their work, they were expected to watch the kids and do their job. Uh, and I'm sure you're thinking what I'm thinking here and that this would certainly include women in academia. Um, because people in academia were lucky enough that they got to continue working from home. But for women, this meant working from home while conducting full-time childcare. So when COVID-19 hit women in academia, um, mothers were in crisis. So we have good quantitative data that confirms what we all assumed. Uh, mothers in academia certainly increased the amount of childcare they had to do. Um, and they decrease the amount of publishing and productivity that they were able to engage in. This, of course, was due to the school closures. 
um, and other childcare facility closures, um, you know, a lot of people lost their childcare and that includes, you know, help from family members, right? Um, in order to stop the spread, we had to, you know, limit our interactions. Um, women in academia reported increased mental health problems. So this included depression and anxiety and feelings of being overwhelmed. They reported both mental and physical exhaustion. Um, and because of this exhaustion and because of being overwhelmed, they said no to conferences, right? They said no to future projects. They said no to putting things on their CV. Um, and this will certainly have an impact down the line on their careers. They felt unsupported by their department. They felt like they couldn't talk about what was happening. And I'm sure that is linked to what we talked about previously in which women in academia feel like they have to hide being a mother because they don't want to be perceived differently, right, for this role as academic and mother. Um, some women took paid leave and some had to add on the task of homeschooling to their daily lives. And even when the child care facilities opened back up, um, for a lot of women this made no difference, right? They were still fearful of the virus rightfully so. They still took on the responsibility of full-time childcare to keep the virus out of their house. This is a near impossible task for an individual to take on when it really is a societal problem. And I think this last wave of Omicron that we've experienced, coupled with the fact that children under five aren't vaccinated, is going to have an even bigger impact on women with younger kids, right? Um, they may choose to keep their kids home because they don't want to expose them to the virus um, when they haven't been vaccinated yet. So when we take a step back and look at all of this, I think a lot of women had to ask themselves, how can I conceivably compete with a man with no kids during a global pandemic, right? In one study on the impact of academics in pandemic parenting, 53% of the respondents stated that men will have more publications in top journals in the coming years. It's really hard to compete with that for job security. Um, women in academia, they're really worried about the permanent long-term damage that this is going to have on their careers. Um, and something that's really concerning to me, at least, is that when we look at, you know, opinions overall, when we take it outside of, you know, academia, there's research out there that shows that people overall are feeling more favorable toward traditional family roles. You know, this means the mom staying at home and dad going to work. It all just became too hard. I think another long-term impact of this pandemic is we're going to see an increase in parental burnout. Um, and this is something I really like to flag whenever I get a platform to talk about mothering. Um, I talk to a lot of moms out there and they feel like they're terrible people because they feel like they cannot handle their role as a parent anymore. They no longer enjoy being with their child. They are no longer fitting into this mold of the ideal mother. And the guilt that comes with that is making them feel even worse. They just don't want to be a parent anymore. This is caused by chronic overwhelming stress. You are not a bad person. If you are experiencing this, you are experiencing parental burnout. And 99% of the women that I speak to who feel this way are parenting with almost no support. Uh, parental burnout is lowest in countries that utilize community in raising children. Um, the more support you have, the less likely you are to suffer from parental burnout. Um, because this pandemic has been such an individualizing experience as well as such an isolating one and an overwhelming one, I do think this is something to flag as I do think this will increase um, rates of parental burnout. Uh, for mothers in all fields, in all experiences. So, you know, the picture doesn't look great, uh, but there are some mitigation strategies that we can utilize to try and contain some of these negative long-term impacts of the pandemic. So the first thing that we can do, 
and I hear this from a lot of mothers uh, in graduate school, is just a simple acknowledgement of our existence. Um, you know, we need to acknowledge that this pandemic affected people differently. It had a different kind of impact on mothers. And I really think that this is the first step in feeling supported and changing university culture and making it more friendly to mothers. Um, I think the next thing that we can do and the next thing that other scholars have argued for is that we need to acknowledge the pandemic specifically during tenure promotion and hiring processes. Uh, there are scholars who have argued that it would be helpful to include the option of a COVID-19 impact statement to explain gaps in their CV. Um, something else that could help mothers recover from the pandemic is added flexibility at work, right? So something that I think would work really well is allowing mothers to teach one last class in order to recover from the pandemic and allow them to get back on track with their research and publishing. Um, something kind of small, but would also work to help achieve that um, acknowledgement of existence would be offering childcare during staff meetings. Um, that's an attainable and meaningful goal. Um, and I also hear that a lot from graduate student mothers. Um, there are a lot of things that are more complicated, um, but they're much needed and those are, you know, added paid leave policies and certainly financial assistance for childcare. This is something that is exceptionally important for graduate student mothers. Lack of childcare and financial resources is a huge reason for the high attrition rate for graduate student mothers and that leaky pipeline. Um, and finally, what we need is we need more research on this topic. This is relatively new. Um, there is not a lot of research on the long-term impacts of the pandemic because you know, it hasn't been that long yet, right? It feels like it's been 10 years, but it's really only been two. So we're just starting to scratch the surface of how this pandemic upended our lives and the long-term impacts of it. So what we need is more research. Um, we need more critical feminist research, and that is getting increasingly hard to find the funding for. So that's all I have for you guys today. Um, and I wanna really acknowledge that this presentation has only scratched the surfaces of mothering and mothering in academia and grad students in academia. Um, but I wanna thank you so much for listening to this guest spot. Um, so as I said earlier, my thesis research explores the impact of the pandemic specifically on graduate student mothers. If you wanna learn more about my findings, please follow me on Twitter. I share a lot of research on mothering and resources for maternal health. Health, I'm super active on there. My Twitter is up on the screen. It's Andy Yedge uh, for Edmonton, Y-E-G. Um, and also, if you just wanna learn more, um, or if you're a mother in academia who wants support or wants to chat, I've also left my email up there. Uh, please feel free to contact me anytime um, to talk about research, to talk about mothering. Um, and I just want to thank you guys again so much for listening. And hopefully this, you know, helps raise awareness to the specific ways in which mothers experience COVID-19.